You're listening to the Shared Security Podcast with Tom Esten and Scott Wright. Exploring the trust you put in people, apps, and technology. Hosted by Scott Wright, the Streetwise Security Coach, and Tom Esten, Penetration Tester and Ethical Hacker. And sponsored by Security Perspectives, your source for tailored security awareness training and assessment solutions. We bring you stories, advice, and tips to help you make better risk decisions because nobody else can make them for you. Hello and welcome to the Shared Security Podcast, episode number 71 for December 13th, 2017. And I'm here uh, with Tom Esten uh, in Cleveland and we have a special guest, Rebecca Harold. How are you doing today, Rebecca? Hello and uh, happy to join you from Des Moines, Iowa. Awesome. So, uh, Tom, uh, I think, uh, did you have any uh, particular agenda for today uh, before we jump in and uh, start uh Grilling uh, Rebecca on, on what she does. <laughs> I didn't. Uh, I think the topic for today is privacy. So uh, yeah, exactly. We go right to it. Rebecca is widely known, if uh, you haven't heard, as the privacy professor. And uh, so I think uh, that goes back quite a ways. How did how did you start that uh, initiative, uh, Rebecca? Sure. Well, um, it's kind of an interesting tale, maybe to some, maybe to others, not so interesting, but. Um, my degrees are in math and computer science, so I started as a systems engineer at a large multinational financial and healthcare organization, and uh, I became responsible for the information security program around 1991 or so. I was asked to build it, and so I was establishing all the information security requirements, policies, procedures, training. Uh, firewalls were comparatively new back then because, of course, we were just getting started to be attached to the Internet in the first half of 1990s. And we came along around 1994. Our organization wanted to put up what would be the first online bank. And I was responsible for establishing all of the security requirements for that site. And as I was doing my research, I said, hey, we need to address privacy because if we're a bank, we're dealing with all this customer information, all this financial information. And so my um, senior VP, who was also the CIO at the time, said, well, that sounds like a good idea. Go talk to the corporate council. Talk to the corporate council. And the corporate council said, you know, that sounds like a good idea, but we, that's not something that's under our responsibility. It's not in our and manuals. Guess, <laughs> it, well, <laughs> just think, in 1994, yep. there were no laws or regulations. Yeah. And so because there were no laws or regulations, of course, the legal department uh, didn't have any legal responsibility for it. So that kind of concerned me. So <laughs> I went back to my CIO and he said, well, let's uh, get the CEO. We'll kind of have a really quick talk. And as you probably know, if you've worked with large organizations, if the larger you are, the smaller your amount of time. So I had about five minutes to make my case uh, for the CEO. And I was pointing out loss of trust and uh, also the fact that we wanted to have long-term customers and so on, on this brand new thing called the internet, where we were hoping people would soon be on all the time at that point in time, you know, and what? He's going, what people are going to buy things on this network. <laughs> well, he, he, he was into it though, because he had bought off on the online bank. Right. 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 So he, he was motivated to make that bank, the bank that people came to and everybody was kind of pushing against him even at the time saying, well, it's not brick and mortar. People can't trust something that's not a bank that's, you know, brick and mortar. So I knew that. And I said, even though we don't have any laws or regulations, uh, I've studied this topic. The OECD has been around for a long time. He knew that the OECD was an international mm -hmm. uh, organization and um, that dealt with many things. And I said, uh, they've had these privacy principles around for a long time. I said, 
this would be a huge differentiator to us to have a privacy policy and establish privacy rules and communicate them to our customers because I'm not seeing anybody else that's planning to do an online bank to do this. So guess what he did? Some I was hoping he would say, oh, I'll get the, the general counsel and his legal department on this. Yeah. Instead, he said, well, that sounds like it is important. Why don't you go do it since you think <laughs> it's uh, so important and you've done the research. Careful what you <laughs> ask for, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, careful, but I am so happy that it happened that way because basically I started doing both security and privacy at the same time. And there is a lot of overlap, but yet there are certainly different areas that don't overlap. But that really helped me to see how you truly need to partner those two together in order to be successful. So step ahead. Yeah. So that's how I got started in privacy. Step ahead to 2000, I left that business to join a consulting company. And then 2004, I started my own business and it was Rebecca Harold and Associates LLC at the time. I started then teaching as an adjunct professor for the Norwich University Master of Science and in Information Security. Um, so with that program, I became an adjunct professor and all my students were calling me Professor Harold. And I thought, you know, I kind of like the the sound of the privacy professor. That would make a good logo. I was trying yeah. to think of a way to brand um, my <laughs> business that it was, you know, yep. that's a long name. <laughs> so I, I thought, well, privacy professor, I went and looked online at the copyright and trademark. Well, that wasn't taken anywhere. And the URL so, is available. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I'm going to. I'm going to submit a trademark for this. I'm going to claim that as my uh, also known as uh, business name. So that's actually the name of my consulting business now as a AKA. AKA. Hmm. And um, then I thought, well, this can give me a chance to uh, exercise my art artist uh, capabilities. So I, I created the, logo for nice. my business as well. And it, and I had about five different uh, designs and I let my sons who were pretty young at the time kind of narrow them down for me. They have pretty good instincts. So <laughs> that's how, that's the long story of how I got into being known as the privacy professor, but I'm glad I did. It stuck. Uh, yeah. I've used you know, back, we were talking about Twitter before uh, we started recording here and on Twitter, I have Privacy Prof. Well, the reason I got Privacy Prof instead of Privacy Professor is, you know, early in Twitterdom, why you weren't allowed a very long. Yeah, they actually name. had limits on the length of your. Uh, they your did. Yeah. They mm -hmm. did. And Privacy Professor was too long. So that's, I never I realized had, that, but that's why my name is StreetSec. That's why it's so short on Twitter as well. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> privacy professor, I had to cut it off and, you know, I should have realized then when they open it up, I don't know how many years later it was that they allowed you to have a longer one. If I was thinking at that time, I would have also claimed privacy professor because yeah. somebody in Germany now, I think has privacy professor. I don't think they're using it, but still, you know, you learn a lesson live and learn. Well, that's great, but names aren't everything, right? It's your uh, your reputation and uh, the body of work. And I, I know you've been pretty prolific with uh, publishing books and speaking and television appearances and all that stuff. Can yeah. you give us a bit of background on on? Uh, I think I know that you've written at least one book on security awareness training because I bought it. Yeah, well, I actually have two editions of that. I uh, put out the first one in two thousand and five. I put out the second edition, and my son, who was, I think, uh, would have been uh, 11 or 12 at the time, created the cover for that second edition book. So um, I have people now asking me when I'm going to put out the next edition. So I guess that'll come someday. But I started writing back in the early 1990s. I've, I'm a longtime member of the Association of Computing Machinery, or ACM. Mm -hmm. 
And mm-hmm. so I wrote a few articles for that. And then uh, I wrote for the uh, Computer Security Institute. Do you remember the CSI? They used to be pretty large and have a lot of um, a lot of conferences. Yeah, yeah. And then they were bought by the company that uh, started commercializing Black Hat a few years ago. Uh, Media. Yep. Yeah. So uh, they purchased CSI, and guess what happened after they purchased CSI? They pretty much did away with CSI. But I wrote for CSI in their monthly newsletters for a long time, and then Rich O'Hanley, who's uh, one of the the head editors at Taylor and Francis, which also has under its umbrella CRC Press and um, Auerbach and all those um, publications. He uh, approached me in 2000 to write my first book, and that was called The Privacy Professor, or not The Privacy, The Privacy Papers, sorry. So um, my first book was The Privacy Papers, and that was published in 2001. And um, as of right now, I had my 19th book published a few months ago, and that one was for ISACA. I actually had two that came out this year that uh, ISACA, are you familiar with ISACA? I maybe should CISA, I? Yep, I am. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So yeah, the if Information Systems Audit and Control Association. So uh, I wrote their two privacy books that were published in January of this year. And then the other one, I think in August or September. So wow. yeah. As I said, you're prolific. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's one thing, and maybe you can relate to this too. I'm, I've always had to do a lot of, I just take a lot of notes. That's yeah. how it goes into my brain and sticks and helps me to think. And so, yeah. you know, that's uh, people have seen that. You might relate to this. When I was at uh, my large organization through the 1990s, I always got stuck with taking meeting notes because everybody liked how detailed they were. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, it I was like, feeling. I gotta leave. Yeah, I gotta leave this place. I'm tired of being the, the meeting note taker. So, uh, that, that kind of lends itself to writing too. And I know you're very prolific too. So I'm sure that that comes into it. If you like to write, it yeah, just makes absolutely. it easier. Yeah. I love to write. I just don't have the time to put it into some coherent big package. Like your, your handbook on security awareness training is like 300 pages. I don't know. I don't know how you got that organized and well, together. Well, it, yeah, it's called uh, working until two or three in the morning. To have <laughs> I used to be able to do that. I'm getting too old for that now. So <laughs> I know, you know, I'm, I'm at that point as well. It's like, I want to, I want to sit back at, a, at least by about 1030 at night and just uh, stop working for a while. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> cool and i know you're on uh, tv sometimes on the news shows there in uh, iowa yeah in des moines so i've been very fortunate uh starting around four or five years ago might be five years ago now uh we had a good uh i think it was called great day here locally oh, yeah. now they changed the name to uh, cw iowa live which doesn't roll off the tongue as easily but <laughs> You know, that there was a, a, a change in ownership. But anyway, uh, they had me on just, uh, gosh, it was back, one of the early uh, data privacy day events. Oh, yeah. um, there used to be the privacy day or something, right? Yeah, and you go Oh, it still and, is. Yeah, yeah, it still is. So January 28th, every day. And back in 2007, I uh, was when I first started getting the... Iowa governor to officially proclaim January 28th as Iowa Data Privacy Day to coincide with International Data Privacy Day. Also that you could get on TV. Well, that's what, you know, that's how it happened that they invited me. They um, uh, had heard that uh, there was this Data Privacy Day and I had actually been on a couple of the other channels to be interviewed about it. And they brought me on and, and their format is a little different on, on the news. Usually your segments last maybe, you know, 30 seconds to a minute, but on those morning talk shows where 
uh, you have a different layout for the different segments. I had 10 to 15 minutes and, um, a lot, they got a lot of good feedback from the viewers because I really wanted to focus on the general public and what they need to do yeah. to make sure that, you know, they're protecting their own privacy, know how to challenge organizations to say, hey, how are you protecting my information? Who are you sharing it with? And then also just help them to, to actually spot some risks that may be around them, like with the ATM skimmers or with people who are calling. And um, as a result of that first show, they said, wow, this is really interesting stuff. Why don't you come back on next month? And so basically, I'm now going on there one to two times a month to talk about, you know, whatever the current uh, security or privacy concerns are. And of as you know, there's always something oh, yeah. no going shortage. on. Exactly. Yes. It's interesting that you mentioned that, you know, the consumer view and, and uh, what they should be holding uh, companies to in terms of a standard. And I know that that was something Tom is kind of interested in in general about how companies' policies, privacy policies are being used or reflected uh, on consumers these days. Tom, did you have any particular questions in that area? Yeah, it's it's an area that I've been, uh, you know, just over, over the last several years, I've tried to do a little more research in, in privacy policies. And, you know, I, I know, Rebecca, you do a ton of research and, and have spoken on uh, the topic of privacy policies. But I always find that, uh, and I guess I'm just curious, just kind of the evolution, as you've seen with privacy policies, um, how they've evolved. Have they've gotten to a point where the, you know, that people are reading them and they make sense and companies now are promoting that, you know, hey, we have this privacy policy, we want you to read it. Whereas I've seen in the past and many years ago that it was kind of this little hidden, you know, little line on their website that, you know, oh, here's a little privacy policy, you know. Um, I'm just wondering if that's changed over the years and, and uh, what your take is on the current state of that. Well, it has changed and it's changed dramatically. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, putting a privacy notice on our website for the bank back in the mid 90s, that was something that just wasn't even thought of to be done, but it was something to do to gain trust. Then as you go along through the years, you see where other organizations started putting that privacy notice. And I'm going to call it a privacy notice because mm -hmm. I like to call the policies the inward-facing mm -hmm. privacy policies that your employees use, even though, you know, when you're out on a website, oftentimes it says privacy policy too. But just for the sake of our discussion, if I say privacy policy, that's going to be inward that your employees inside your organization has to follow, whereas privacy notice is your promise to your people who are visiting your website and it's, t it's what you're telling them that you will do. So um, as time went on, uh, it started to become quite common, especially for retail sites to put privacy notices on their website. And what they would generally do in those early days, let's say around 2000, 2001, it was starting to become more popular for them to put privacy notices up. Um, they would actually just go out uh, to the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which is an international organization has, that has members who are countries from all over the world, and the U.S. is one of the members, too. Anyway, the OECD, I mentioned that I had looked at their um, their privacy principles to, to make our first privacy notice at the organization I was at. And uh, at their site, they actually had at that time um, in the mid 90s, and they still have it up to today, it's, it's evolved, but they had what they called a privacy notice generator. So you would put in some uh, answers to some questions and they would generate a privacy notice for you to place on your website. Well, guess what? A lot of organizations use that, which is good, but they would generate their privacy notice, post it on their homepage or a link to it 
from their homepage and forget about it. They wouldn't do mm-hmm. what uh, that privacy notice was promising they would do, but it looked good, right? Well, this looks good. It's good for marketing because it shows that we care about privacy, even if we aren't really doing what it says we're doing. Well, come along around 2001, 2002, um, there was an organization that had one of these privacy notices posted. It was called Toy Smart. Toy Smart uh, had in their privacy notice what was very good. It sounded great. It said, we will never sell your personal information to anybody else or give it, let anybody else have it and so on. They went through bankruptcy. And what does an organization often do when they go through bankruptcy? They sell their customer lists. And so they sold their customer lists. And some of the people on that list started getting information or or communications from the buyer and a lot of marketing. They said, well, wait, you promised to us in your privacy notice that you would never share our information with any other organization. And Toy Smart was like, yeah, but, you know, (laughs) we're going through bankruptcy, so that doesn't really matter anymore, does it? Well, these uh, people that were having their information sold, some of them were lawyers, and they said, yeah, it kind of does matter. So they contacted the Federal Trade Commission or the FTC. The FTC has the oversight, and this was kind of their first big case to bring to to, uh, court under uh, Section 5 of the Unfair Business Practices Act, uh, of the FTC Act, actually, for unfair uh, business practices. And they basically said, you know what? You promised that you would not sell or give your customer's information to anyone else in your privacy notice, but yet you did. And Toy Smart's like, yeah, but, you know, We're going through bankruptcy. FTC said, well, that doesn't matter. If you want to be able to actually sell that information, I guess, you know, the customer list was worth the most of any part of their remaining business. I mean, they were selling it for like millions of dollars. The FTC said, if you want to sell that, you need to go out to each of those people and get their permission to sell their information to someone else. And Toy Smart's like, you got to be kidding me. I mean, look at all these millions of people. That's going to take more money for us to do that than anything else. So uh, it it came down to it. Their deal kind of fell through and they didn't do it, but they still had a fine to pay from the FTC. And that established a long history now of the FTC holding organizations accountable to follow their privacy policy under the FTC Act, Section 5, for unfair business practices, unfair and deceptive business practices. And that is still uh, one of the interesting regulations that is not explicitly a privacy regulation, per se, but it's saying if you're making a promise, be it a privacy promise, a security, any kind of promise, you have to follow it or you are going to be found guilty of unfair um, and deceptive business practices and will not only give you a potentially huge fine because they've, they've actually applied multi-million dollar fines, some of them in the tens of millions of dollars under that FTC Act um, clause, but they also will have then a 20-year um, corrective action plan that includes the ability for the FTC to request a at any point in time, a copy of that organization's um, policies, procedures, training, what they're doing to make sure they're doing things right. Soon after the Toy Smart incident or situation, you might have heard of uh, the case where uh, Eli Lilly was uh, found guilty under that same unfair and deceptive trade practices because they were doing. Um, in I think 2002, maybe 2003, they were sending out these uh, emails to the folks who had prescriptions for, um, it was a depressed, oh, it was a drug to help with depression. I'm trying to think of the name of it. The name's slipping my mind right now. 
but it was very well known at the time. I don't see ads for it too much anymore. But as soon as you saw it, you know, oh gosh, this person's suicidal. They're on this uh, this drug and they're getting a prescription. Well, they were sending out reminders to this large mail list of everybody who had a prescription to this uh, particular drug. And somebody new to Eli Lilly made a mistake when they were the ones that were supposed to send out the reminder. Instead of putting all of the people's names within the blind courtesy copy um, or carbon copy portion of the email, they put it in just the plain uh, carbon copy or CC portion. So this email went out to hundreds or thousands of people who prescri- uh, had prescriptions for this depressing, uh, depressant drug. And everybody saw everyone else who was, you know, had a prescription for this drug. And because of that, again, it violated their privacy promise that they would never let anyone know that, uh, they were somebody who had this prescription for this drug. They were found guilty of, uh, violating the FTC act again, similar to toy smart, but in this case, again, they got a multi-million dollar fine. They had to do certain things to build up their information security and privacy department. And they got a 20-year consent decree that included requiring all of their staff to go through training for having policies, procedures, for implementing certain security controls, and so on. So the FTC Act is still very actively used as a way to enforce those privacy notices that you see on websites throughout, you know, any organization in the United States or that is providing services or products or any type of information through their website in the United States. Interesting. So do you feel that uh, consumers are actually reading privacy policies these, these days? Well, I see it go through waves. So when they first came out, they had these OECD uh, formatted privacy notices, privacy policies on the website. And I think people did read them, but they were so long and they were written with such legalese. And, you know, it wasn't something that the general public who you should be writing to the general public at anywhere from like a a sixth grade reading level generally. Mm -hmm. This was more like at your college level, and some of them I saw was like graduate level type of, oh. of wording in these privacy notices. So uh, the FTC, again, as an example early on, actually sent out warnings to businesses. They took one year, I think it might have been around 2004, 2005, and they reviewed every, went out and reviewed like a thousand websites, their privacy notices, and they had a a report that they did to say how awful these privacy notices were and how misleading, even if the words were um, accurate, they were hard to understand and so on. So they put out a a warning to them saying, you know, you got to make your privacy notices better. They, you need to make them so they're easier to read, easier to understand. And Oh, by the way, here's another thing they found that, a lot of organizations were doing. They would make at the top of their privacy notice all of these great promises about how they're going to protect their information and how, you know, they'll never share it. And then they'd get to the very bottom and literally in much smaller font, they would say, oh, by the way, we reserve the right to (laughs) change this policy at any time. And we reserve the right to not be responsible if something happens to your organization. Uh, information or so on and so forth. That is where they said, we are not going to find this acceptable. In fact, we will give you higher fines and penalties if we see that you're doing something like that. So that's kind of when they started coming out and saying, you know, you cannot in your privacy notice make promises at the beginning and then take away all of those promises in the back end, especially using a a six point font when you were using 14 point font for everything else or something yeah. like that. So when, when was that Rebecca, that, uh, that particular sort of event happened? Do you remember? That was in 
was around 2004, 2005, I think. Um, it's been several years ago now. So after that, then they suggested using what we call layered um, privacy notices, meaning they suggested and they took a year or two. It might have come out around 2007, 2008. I wish I would have uh, looked at a timeline before we did our call held here. But uh, soon after that, you know, because everybody was saying, well, you know, what do you expect? If you're going to give us these fines and penalties, then at least tell us what you're looking for. So they were promoting around 2007 or so a layered privacy notice, meaning they suggested on just one page saying one statement for each of the principles, like we will not share your information. We will not do this. We will not do that. But then from each of those, you could click on it. And if you wanted more information about how that would be accomplished, then it would go to another page that would have some more information about that specific privacy promise, but it had to be written in clear information. So that was an improvement. So between around 2001, it was degrading and how people were really reading those privacy notices up until about 2007 when the suggested came out. So then the public started reading the privacy notices more because they made more sense. But then what the organizations uh, started doing was making it hard to find those privacy notices on their website. <laughs> so, hmm. you know, at one time you would have a big notice that either at the top of the page, it said privacy notice or privacy policy, click here. Sometimes it was in a big icon at the left side of your um, screen. Well, then it moved to the very bottom of the screen and kind of a small font along with the about us and contact us and all those other things at the very bottom. So then they said, well, you need to make it so it's obvious and easier to find. And so in the, the past 10 years, they've really been not only in the United States encouraging organizations to make their privacy notices much more available and transparent and easier to find. But as we get more and more laws and regulations outside of the U.S., um, that is uh, creating a need to make your privacy policies much clearer and easier to find, too. I mean, the uh, European Union General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, is going to go into effect May 25th of 2018. And it has 99 articles, uh, which would be like a book chapter, I guess you could call it, uh, within that. And it does have a section in there under one of these articles of, of many different requirements for what is necessary with regard to giving notice to any individual that uh, you're collecting personal information from. And it's not just your customers or your patients, it's also your employees and those people that you hire on contract to do uh, work for you and so on. So any type of personal information, even if you don't have a financial relationship with them, you still have to protect their information uh, to a certain level. So right now we're kind of going through another evolution in that privacy notice because Many, many organizations in the United States, even if they don't have targeted clients or customers in the European Union, they hire organizations and have workers in the European Union. So they still have to comply with the GDPR. So now they're having to kind of rewrite their policies to fit the requirements of the GDPR. Very interesting. Yeah, I think it's, awesome. we're, we're hearing a lot about that here in Canada as well. Obviously, um, a lot of organizations are trying to align, you know, the privacy uh, requirements and policies internally with uh, the GDPR just because they're going to be dealing with European organizations at some time or other. Mm -hmm. Well, and even if like uh, with my business with Simbus, we have a uh, not only some clients over there, but we also have uh, some of our uh, servers are hosted over there. 
where we have, you know, our our systems, we have multiple locations for redundancy throughout different countries. So uh, one of our servers is located over there. And as a result of that, we have people who are supporting our servers who are in Europe. So we're going to have to comply with GDPR as well, just because we have the names and some personal information of folks who are working for us to support our service servers. And I think a lot of organizations don't understand that, you know, in that situation, that obligates you to comply with mm-hmm. GDPR then. Yeah, exactly. That's a great segue to, uh, you mentioned Simba. So I uh, wanted to make yeah. sure you had a chance to, to talk about the, the stuff that you're most excited about right now. Well, with Simbus, I was excited for that because, as I mentioned, I started in 2004 my consulting business. And through that, besides writing a ton of policies and procedures and also creating training and awareness, I did a lot of risk assessments. And uh, I did, besides risk assessments for an organization, I also did third party or vendor assessments. And I had created my methodology. So at one time, for example, uh, for a large international organization I was doing vendor assessments for, I was doing my methodology and I would actually be doing at one point, I got up to doing 20 concurrent vendor assessments for 20 different vendors at one time. And it took a lot of concentration, but, you know, as I was doing it, I was thinking, this this can be automated. I mean, so much of this can be automated. There's there's a portion of this that truly does require a little bit more human analysis or you know other types of of human thinking. But ninety to ninety five percent of this, if I could just automate it and have the questions and have all the different possible answers and all the different possible responses to those answers and and how to mitigate the associated risk this would cut down my time in doing a risk assessment i mean doing a risk assessment and doing the vendor assessments just creating the the reports alone could take me 2 to 3 weeks and then you know gathering it and inputting it before that would take a lot of time so i was trying from around 2008 on trying to find someone I could partner with who had the resources to provide the the hardware and the software and the programmer so that I, I've been creating and writing up the specs and also architecting what the system would look like. But of course, I didn't have the funds to pay for the hardware. I didn't have the funds to pay for the programmers. And so... Um, as time went on, I was very fortunate to find around 2014, uh, a person, David Greek, he's my business partner in it. He had actually been out looking for someone uh, to do a, a HIPAA uh, compliance type of service mm-hmm. with. He had been uh, doing some work for somebody who was selling, you know, HIPAA DVDs, compliance DVDs, but he was kind of looking for someone who could help to put it online. So he came across, you know, I've written a couple of HIPAA books and also a bunch of other HIPAA stuff out there for healthcare. He came across me and he's like, oh, this looks like some good information. So he found me. So it was just lucky that, you know, he found me and he had the programmers, he had, the investors, he had the hardware and software, and then I had the ideas and I had the specs and I had uh, the architecture description. So we started uh, partnering and building Symbus in uh, 2014, and we started focused on just healthcare and um, HIPAA. But during that time, you know, my goal was always to just provide these automated services for any industry. So um, after we established everything for the healthcare space, then I created content and also uh, the associated requirements for compliance for uh, financial. 
And then I created a set for financial and uh, health care because, as I mentioned, the organization I worked for through the 90s was both financial and health care. And I knew a lot of other organizations are like that, too. And then I also created what I call a universal set. So the universal is based upon ISO 27001, 27002, the U.S. cybersecurity framework, and then, you know, the privacy principles. So I have all this different content and within it, I've automated so you can have one platform, one location to go to, to not only manage your program, if you're a CISO, if you're a CPO, if you're a security manager, whatever, this gives you everything you need for your full program. So through it, you, um, I've created the tasks that uh, most organizations need to follow in order to have a comprehensive and effective program. So I have those tasks and I've automated as many as possible. I have a learning management system that I built into it, along with uh, putting out new training um, modules at least uh, once a quarter. When I get more time, I want to put out at least one every month. So I have the training and, and awareness platform. I have the risk management platform, which includes the assessments. Um, I have vendor management at oversight. I have employee management, so you can assign and push out to them what they need to do. And and everything's logged. You can store and upload um, all of your documentation to validate and show um, evidence of what you're doing throughout time to manage your program uh, and I have all sorts of neat uh, pan, uh, dashboards, so you see different progress meters to see where you're at, how far behind you are. With my risk assessment in particular, what really used to bug me about risk assessments is you'd spend all that time on a risk assessment. You deliver the report, they get the report, and then they would, would either lay there on their desk and gather dust, or they're like, well what do we do now? You know, we know what's wrong. So I made the risk assessment report interactive. So once you finish your risk assessment, you can go into your report for each finding. You can establish a corrective action plan for that finding to mitigate it. You uh, can assign people responsibilities. You can set target dates you can attach your evidence to show what you're doing to mitigate it as time goes on. And then I have for each of those findings, you can see your progress over time. So you can see how close you are to getting your corrective action plan finished. And what I really wanted to do was to have one visual through the dashboard for this too. So if your executives ever said, well, where are you at with mitigating everything with your you know, risk assessment, you can point to this dashboard and it shows you in four different quadrants where you're at with your progress and how far you need to go. Same thing goes with your security and privacy program. You can show them this dashboard and say, here's where we're at with uh, what we need to do. And, and you can see by the red or the yellow what we still need to work on. So, you know, I was trying to create something that would also provide value to those responsible so they could just show it to their CEO and actually demonstrate their value to say, oh, that person's doing a lot. <laughs> we can see that through all of this documentation. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. So we, I mean, we, I mean did you have any uh, questions, Tom? No, no. I'm, I'm just glad we uh, got to chat a little bit about privacy policy, uh, privacy uh, uh, policies and that, but uh, no. I don't have anything else. So uh, the uh, the Simbus 360 solution set, then you've got a bunch of different solutions, right, that you, you offer for different areas. Was part of that, it seems familiar, you and I talked about it, I think maybe earlier, uh, a few years ago. Was that part of the Compliance Helper um, now, solution? Now, Compliance that Helper, doing? no, Compliance Helper is different. I own all of the content that I created for them, but Compliance Helper, I was kind of, I got in, uh, involved with them back around 2008 because I thought that would be a way I could do, you know, what I had this vision to do. But their owners really wanted to focus just on policies and procedures. Oh, okay. So 
I went ahead, I, you know, I thought, well, I can still go ahead. I'll, I'll make, you know, I kept ownership of all of my content, which I'm glad I've been doing over the years because I found, um, that's been very beneficial for me and my sure. business progress. But um, I, I retained ownership. So they I still maintain uh, the clients through Compliance Helper. But again, that's just policies and procedures, and it's just for healthcare. Wow. But I wanted to branch out and do so much more. So that's why I wanted to, to be, you know, mm-hmm. part owner, uh, significant part owner of my own business where I could call the shots and also create and put into actual practice what was in my brain, put it actually <laughs> online for people. <laughs> That's amazing because you got so much in there that uh, it's it's good you can get it uh, into an efficient system for helping people. That's great. And, well, uh, and just one more thing, we're moving now um, to a channel partner only. So we've made this great platform, but we see a lot of value in having like consultancies or MSPs or associations or log firms and uh, um, accounting firms. They can use our platform and put their logo on it. Right. And then they can support their clients through our platform and we provide them with all the platform and content, but it's their logo. So, you know, it's one of, yeah, it's one of those things I, I view us, you know, on computers, it set, has that sticker Intel inside. <laughs> on. Yeah. We're the Intel inside. So Simbus inside means, you know, we have the engine that really drives the automation for security and privacy management for all these other types of organizations that want to directly support their own end users with it. Awesome. That's great. So uh, I know you've got a hard stop in a few minutes. Just wondered if the, to, to finish off, if there are any recent news stories or things that have been top of mind for you uh, lately in, in the news or uh, with respect to privacy and security? Well, yeah, I mean, GDPR has been uh, very actively talked about. Also encryption. I mean, I'm a long time proponent of encryption and, and if you see the news, you, you see this coming back all the time about um, like the government uh, agencies who reference encryption as though it's an evil thing for their work. And that's <laughs> something that, oh my gosh. And, you know, you know, me coming from having a <laughs> master's degree in that in computer science and math, it's like, no, 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 you know, you, <laughs> That's a vulnerability, but the problem is most lawmakers, with the exception of you know a couple of of people in Congress, most lawmakers don't understand technology that well, and all they do is listen to oh well that's slowing us down. So, I guess one of the things I've been trying to communicate with a lot online through different writings and also even directly to um, some of my own lawmakers here in Iowa is explain to them how you need strong encryption to help protect your information. If you put a back door in it, you know, just so it'll give you access, that's not going to solve anything because guess what? Encryption is available worldwide. Mm -hmm. If, if you want to use strong encryption and you can't find it in the U S you're going to get it from another country that has strong encryption. So now all you've accomplished is you've made technology from the U.S. weak and all those businesses that want to provide that technology to others are going to be seen as having weak security because they have weak encryption. So we're going to lose business to other countries who offer strong encryption that people know won't give uh, folks potentially access to their data. And there's so much more I could talk about here, but I can tell you that uh, I have had some of my targeted clients who want to do business with me um, say that they're waiting to see what comes about with this encryption debate, because they're so afraid that if they do business with a U.S. organization, that their um, client data will be viewed or reviewed, uh, inspected 
by the government. And I think that's just a, a very, that's a damaging thing to most of the tech companies in the U.S. Yeah. And here in Canada, we're kind of wel- welcoming all those people that want to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he yeah. always says that. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Canada. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, well, thanks very much, Rebecca. I really appreciate your uh, your insights and uh, stories. And it's uh, always great to hear from you. And uh, we may invite you back uh, sometime in the near future if uh, you're available to give us updates. Happy to talk with you. And um I guess too. When will your uh, when will this be broadcast? I know you can edit this out sure. that we're talking about. Well, it'll usually within a week or two. We we get things out. Uh, uh, depends sort of on on our own availability. It's not on a schedule, so sure. um, we'll uh, we'll let you know for sure when uh, when it's available, so that we can uh, all sort of coordinate our marketing of it. Yes, yes, because I do want to point to it through various social media. Mm-hmm. outlets and then put it in my, I don't know if you, um, if you actually subscribe to my privacy professor tips, yep, it comes yep, out yep. each month. Oh, so great. great. Every month. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that goes out to about 5,000 subscribers and probably, two, yeah, about two thirds of them are actually businesses. A lot of them are in, you know, just consumers, but a lot of them go to businesses who actually then send it out to their uh, own employees internally. So um, it's kind of fun. I'm starting to run into people uh, who, well, like I have a physical therapist and it was funny after I was, uh, after I had appointments with him for a couple of months, he said, Hey, I, I read your publication came out. They sent it to us. That was really interesting about this and that. And I said, Oh, that's cool. They send my publication to you guys each. Oh yeah. They send it each month. So, you know, that just really made my day as he was putting me through pain. It kind of uh, softened the pain of physical therapy. <laughs> Keep your mind off the, the pain. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, uh, I guess maybe we should just give you a chance to, uh, Give us some contact information if people want to uh, reach out to you. Yes, definitely. So I'd be happy to hear from any of your listeners. You can reach me by going to my websites. Uh, They are Symbus360.com. Also, you can go to privacyprofessor.org. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter at privacyprof. If you want to send me an email, my email address is Rebecca Harold at Rebecca And uh, that is exactly like it sounds. There's no punctuation between my first and last name in that email address. And it's H E R O L D, right? Yeah. R E B E C C A H E R O L D at R E B E C C A H E R O L D.com. Awesome. Great. And we're going to put that information in our show notes, uh, go with the audio on the website. And so uh, we're, I think we're all finished for today, but uh, once again, thanks very much, Rebecca. And uh, we'll uh, talk to you hopefully again soon sometime. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Yep. Thanks, Tom.